now turning to my friend Angelina Allen. She is a lifelong Baha'i and the author of two important books. Uh, the first one, which we had her uh, talk about a year or so ago, John David Bosch in the Vanguard of Heroes, Martyrs, and Saints. And now, of course, just published When the Moon Set Over Haifa, which is a book basically about those last days of Abu Baha uh, on this earth and the subsequent month or so afterwards looked at through the eyes of the six American pilgrims who were there at the time. Uh, she holds an MA in writing and rhetoric from the University of California in San Diego. She's been a high school English teacher for over 30 years and lives in Southern California with her husband, Andrew Allen. So I will now turn this all over to Angie. Welcome very much to this Wilmot Institute webinar and we're really looking forward to hearing you speak today. Thank you. Um, the title of the book, When the Moon Set Over Haifa, of course, I had to really think about what that title would be, because when Abdu'l-Bahá passed away, it was the night of the waning moon. And I didn't think that when the moon waned over Haifa would sound very good. So I called it when the moon set over Haifa. Um, I'm going to um, be sharing some slides today that are um, archival in nature, and some of them include some holy places. And so I'm going to elect to, um, to mute my video. Um, it's wonderful how the Wilmette Institute has continued to offer ways in which um, people can connect on a personal level and in doing so explore paths of service. And this logo that the Wilmette Institute has put together has some really interesting perspectives of what those paths of service are. Um, making an effort to learn is certainly one of those paths of service. And this miracle of world intercommunication has extended that learning across the globe. In the publication called The World Order of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Effendi outlined advancements that would unfold as a result of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Writing in 1938, Shoghi Effendi explained that a mechanism of intercommunication would be devised embracing the entire planet, freed from national hindrances and restrictions, and functioning with marvelous swiftness and perfect regularity. In so many ways, the Wilmette Institute has applied the advantages of the internet to explore Baha'i approaches to social transformation through courses uh, for university credit, courses in community learning, and webinars. In today's webinar, let us take a journey in time 100 years ago to the passing of Abdu'l-Bahá, which took place on a moonless night in Haifa. I have written about the passing of Abdu'l-Bahá in this book, which takes the reader back in time 100 years ago to the house of Abdu'l-Bahá in Haifa and the events that took place in the weeks preceding his passing. Baha'u'llah, in his will and testament, gave Abdu'l-Bahá sole authority to interpret Baha'u'llah's teachings and thereby perpetuate the unity of the cause of God. That unity can be represented by this symbol, wherein the line above represents the realm of God, the line below it represents the realm of God's creation, and the line in between represents the manifestations of the teachings of God. The line that connects these realms represents the divine covenant between God and his creation, as revealed through God's holy manifestations. The holy manifestations of the Baha'i faith are the Bab and Baha'u'llah. After the passing of Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Bahá was named by Baha'u'llah as the center of the covenant of Baha'u'llah and the perfect exemplar of the teachings of Baha'u'llah. This relationship between Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Bahá can be understood by thinking about the relationship between the sun and the moon. The sun is the source of the light, and the moon is a reflection of that light. In that same way, Abdu'l-Bahá's life is a perfect reflection of the light of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, a revelation destined to unite all the peoples of the world in one universal cause, one common faith. 
From 1853 until his passing in 1892, Baha'u'llah was banished, exiled, and imprisoned for proclaiming the oneness of God, the oneness of religion, the oneness of humanity. It is important to note that when Baha'u'llah was sent into exile, the family of Baha'u'llah joined Baha'u'llah in his exile from Tehran to Baghdad, then to Constantinople and Adrianople, and finally to the prison city of Akka. Therefore, Abdul Baha, pictured here at the age of 24, was only a boy when he joined Baha'u'llah in his exile, and it was not until Abdul Baha was a man of 68 years that he was free to travel. In 1911, Abdul Baha began his journey to the West, traveling from Haifa to Egypt, North America, Europe, and North America, arriving in New York in April 1912. His primary purpose in coming to New York was to speak at the Conference on International Arbitration, where Abdu'l-Bahá challenged the attendees to be willing to take action rather than deliver speeches about universal peace in a peaceful corner of the globe. Abdu'l-Bahá spoke at the International Peace Forum in New York to more than a thousand people in the audience to whom he said, we all know and admit that justice is good, but there is need of volition and action to carry out and manifest it. Abdul Baha spoke at religious sites such as the Plymouth Congregational Church in Chicago, hotels such as the Ansonia in New York, and universities such as Stanford University in California, where he was invited to speak before 1,800 students and 180 faculty, to whom he said, we live upon this earth for a few days and then rest beneath it forever. Shall man fight for the tomb which devours him, for his eternal sepulcher? What ignorance could be greater than this? To fight over his grave, to kill another for his grave. What heedlessness, what delusion. Abdu'l-Bahá also spoke to the believers in North America, encouraging them in their efforts to promote the teachings of Baha'u'lláh. He is pictured here in the tent, pitched on the future site of the House of Worship in Wilmette, Illinois, where Abdu'l-Bahá laid its cornerstone. These houses of worship are the dawning place of the remembrance of God and where we see the familiar nine-pointed design symbolizing unity. After 239 days in North America, Abdu'l-Bahá set sail from New York on December 5th, 1912, and those who met him during his visit bid farewell to one who remains without parallel in religious history. Abdu'l-Bahá returned to his home in Haifa in December of 19. 13, where he continued to host visitors and pilgrims from all parts of the world. On the night of the passing of Abdu'l-Bahá in November of 1921, there were six believers from the West who were present in Haifa that night. There was John Bosch, who said that in the teachings of Baha'u'llah, I found that in reality, we have only one God and one truth. The foundation of all religions is one. Also present on the night of the passing of Abdu'l-Bahá was Louise Bosch, who had become a Baha'i at Greenacre through the efforts of Lua Getzinger and May Maxwell. Louise said, the faith of Baha'u'llah filled me with a zeal to serve and a recognition of how privileged one is to be part of the beginning of a new order in the world. Their story is a remarkable one, characterized by a life of service to the betterment of society. You can read about them in this book. One of my favorite stories about John Bosch is how he was drawn to Abdu'l-Bahá like a magnet. John Bosch said, when I heard that Abdu'l-Bahá was on the ocean to America, I felt a strong desire to meet him, not to meet him for curiosity or a novelty, but for a longing to see him. 
John Bosch boarded a train from Oakland, California in April 1912 and arrived at the Hotel Ansonia in New York and waited outside the rooms of Abdu'l-Bahá. John Bosch said, in a few minutes I was called into his parlor and I had in mind to enter cool and resigned as into a business office. With a warm handshake, Abdu'l-Bahá greeted me and said, I have been longing to see you. He offered me a chair and to be seated close to where he was seated. And I said that I was greatly pleased and fortunate to see him so early in New York and that I traveled 3,000 miles to see him, to which Abdu'l-Bahá replied, I have traveled 8,000 miles to see you. Another believer present in Haifa on the night of the passing of Abdu'l-Bahá was Grace Krug of New York. She said that the more I studied the tenets of the Baha'i movement, the more convinced I became of the importance of its demands for a universal peace. Many of us know Grace Krug indirectly through this photograph of Abdu'l-Bahá taken on July 24th, 1912 in Dublin, New Hampshire. On that same day, Abdu'l-Bahá turned to Mirza Mahmoud Sargani, who had been keeping a diary of Abdu'l-Bahá's experiences in America. To, Ab to Mahmoud, Abdu'l-Bahá said, write this in your book. The time will come when Mrs. Krug's whole family will be proud of her and her faith. Her husband is still distant and heedless. The time will come when he will feel himself exalted on account of Mrs. Krug's faith. I see what they do not see. Ere long, the whole of her family will consider the faith of that lady as the crown of honor on their heads. Dr. Krug was a well-known surgeon and medical researcher in New York. He grew up in Germany and was a student of the Mansur Academy, where opponents would strike each other with a sword from a fixed position, each with the aim of suffering a wound that would leave a scar. Such a scar would become a symbol of pride and a sign of the person's ability to be unwavering in their opinions. Dr. Krug's prominent scar on his left jaw was indeed a sign of his fixed opinions. When his wife, Grace Krug, invited Abdu'l-Bahá to speak at their home in New York in 1912, Dr. Krug threatened to have have the doorman throw him out. But when Abdu'l-Bahá arrived, Dr. Krug was completely disarmed by Abdu'l-Bahá's kindness. Dr. Krug's daughter said, I don't know anyone who opposed the faith more violently than my father, but Abdu'l-Bahá gave him that love that my father could not resist. In 1920, Dr. Krug and his wife traveled to Haifa to see Abdu'l-Bahá. Grace Krug had been a Baha'i already for nearly 20 years, but it was not until this trip, trip to Haifa in 1920 that Dr. Krug became an avowed believer. There is a touching story that Dr. Krug tells of this pilgrimage in 1920, a story that reveals Dr. Krug's love for Abdu'l-Bahá. Dr. Krug said that on one occasion, when Abdu'l-Bahá came into the garden, Dr. Krug took a photograph of Abdu'l-Bahá, whereupon Abdu'l-Bahá turned and said in English to Dr. Krug, you are a thief. Later in the day, Abdu'l-Bahá referred to this incident jokingly saying, there is a thief among us. I shall have him delivered to the judges for punishment. To which Dr. Krug replied, I am ready to receive the severest punishment because I have stolen the most precious thing on this earth, namely the picture of our beloved master. After their pilgrimage in 1920, Florian and Grace Krug decided to sell Dr. Krug's medical practice in New York and move to Haifa, where Dr. Krug could serve as physician to the family of Abdu'l-Bahá. Society circles frowned upon Grace Krug's abandonment of her social prestige in New York's high society, and newspapers across the country ridiculed Dr. Krug for abandoning his wealth. But an honor greater than material wealth awaited Dr. Krug. He 
would have the unique honor of attending Abdul Baha at his bedside in the moments before his ascension and of perceiving Abdul Baha's last breath upon this earthly plane. Joanna Hauf was a pilgrim from Stuttgart, Germany. She grew up in a castle like home called Villa Hauf. In 1913, Abdul Baha visited Stuttgart, where he spoke to a large gathering of over 100 friends at a home across the street from Villa Hauf. Although we cannot be certain that Joanna Hauf was at this gathering, it is likely that she was aware of the event as it drew so many friends from Stuttgart and the surrounding areas. Sometime around 1921, Joanna Hauf wrote to Abdul Baha asking permission to make a pilgrimage to Haifa. She was 27 years old and traveling alone with it, what was not permitted by her parents. At that time, John and Louise Bosch happened to be en route to Haifa. And when they stopped in Stuttgart to visit the Baha'is there, they invited Joanna Hauf to travel to Haifa with them. They arrived in Haifa in mid-November and were housed at the Pilgrim House across and over from the house of Abdul Baha. In the evenings, Abdul Baha would walk to the Pilgrim House and dine with the pilgrims. On one of those occasions, Abdul Baha noticed that Joanna Hauf was quiet at the table and asked her what was on her mind. She said, my thoughts are in Germany and the question of how can I do justice to this holy cause? Abdul Baha replied, I wish that you learn Arabic and Persian well so that you can translate the holy scriptures of Baha'u'llah into your mother tongue. This is my personal wish for you. And since the time is very precious, a teacher will be selected for you here in Haifa so that you can get your first Persian course right away. Joanna Hauf studied Arabic and Persian all her life. She pioneered from Germany to Austria and helped form the first National Spiritual Assembly of Austria in 1959. She is pictured here at her home in Innsbruck, where she worked on translating the writings of Baha'u'llah until the end of her life. Curtis Kelsey from New York was not in Haifa as a pilgrim. Rather, he was there to carry out an electrical project for Abdul Baha. To the caretaker of the Shrine of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha wrote, a dear guest is coming to you. He is the person who is going to arrange the lighting of the holy shrines. At the time, the Shrine of the Bab was only the foundation structure that had been built by Abdul Baha. In time, as a result of Curtis Kelsey's electrical installation, the Shrine of the Bab would become the brilliant landmark that it is today. Curtis Kelsey also installed electricity in the Shrine of Baha'u'llah, pictured here as it appeared in 1921 and as it appears today. Abdul Baha said that the Bay of Haifa would be illumined in the shape of an ark by the light of the Shrine of the Bab on one end and the light of the Shrine of Baha'u'llah on the other, so that the light from one shrine would reach the light of the other even in the darkness of night. Today, the Bay of Haifa is indeed illumined, and one can imagine that the light of the Shrine of the Bab reaches across the bay to the Shrine of Baha'u'llah. It is important to remember that, Baha that Abdul Baha's sacred remains are interred in a temporary vault in the Shrine of the Bab, where they have been for 100 years. Soon, the sacred remains of Abdul Baha will be moved to a shrine dedicated to him, which is being built in a vicinity that lies between the shrines of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. On the night of the passing of Abdul Baha a century ago, the six Western believers were staying either at the house of Abdul Baha or the pilgrim house across and over from the house of Abdul Baha. Curtis Kelsey was staying in the pilgrim house, as were John and Louise Bosch. 
Joanna Hauf, who normally stayed in the pilgrim house, stayed in the house of Abdu'l-Bahá on the night of his passing, and Grace and Florian Krug had been given the upstairs room of Abdu'l-Bahá, and Abdu'l-Bahá took one of the rooms downstairs near the front entrance of the house. When the occupants of the house of Abdu'l-Bahá went to sleep on November 27th, they never imagined that after midnight, Dr. Krug would be called downstairs to the bedside of Abdu'l-Bahá. He said, shortly after 1 a.m., I was hastily summoned to his bedside. I had the great privilege of perceiving his last earthly breath and of closing his loving eyes. Those who were sleeping in the pilgrim house were awakened and called to the house of Abdu'l-Bahá. John Bosch said, in a few minutes, we were running to the house of Abdu'l-Bahá. Doctors were leaving the house, and we entered the room, finding all the family of Abdu'l-Bahá there, Abdu'l-Bahá resting in bed as though he were still alive. Approaching the bed, I could not resist to take his hand, not trusting he was dead. It was warm and lifelike. Then I touched his forehead and hoped that he still might utter a word, but it was only too true that our master had passed away. His spirit had departed. The sister of Abdu'l-Bahá then kindly reached her hand to me and motioned me to sit beside her, which I did. The room became filled with friends and people from the town and the antechamber, and the hall too became filled. Thousands of thoughts went through my mind in those moments. Sometimes there comes to all of us feelings that sigh for expression when only our silence really registers the depth of our emotion. So I cannot express the deep stirrings within me when all in deep silence I arose again and touched the hand and forehead of Abdu'l-Bahá still warm. And I said, oh, Abdu'l-Bahá. Louise Bosch said, I had then the feeling that we were standing in a room and in a presence to which no known privilege had given us entrance. I felt that this one time surely we had literally rushed in where angels feared to tread and that the shock of Abdu'l-Bahá's sudden passing was the cause that had removed certain barriers and restrictions. John Bosch was given the great privilege of joining members of the family of Abdu'l-Bahá in preparing his body for burial. The funeral followed the next day, and John Bosch describes it in vivid detail. The hour for the funeral had been set for nine o'clock the next morning, Tuesday, November 29th, as from an invisible command, Six of us raised the wooden casket to our shoulder, I being at the head. A call was given, the doors of the house of Abdu'l-Bahá were opened, and the casket was lifted from the floor by the appointed pallbearers, who carried it out the front door and down the steps and through the gate to the road which led up Mount Carmel. About 40 carriages were waiting at the gate to join the funeral cortege, but only about five were occupied as all wished to honor Abdu'l-Bahá by humbly walking after his remains. Even the British High Commissioner, who had come specially overnight from Jerusalem, walked with the others. Beside him in full uniform was the chief of police of Haifa, who had left his horse standing in the street near the house of Abdu'l-Bahá. The governor of Phoenicia also walked. There were men of all nations, of all creeds, of all walks of life, high and low, rich and poor. It seemed that never had there been such a funeral procession. So great was the desire to help carry the casket up the mountain that some of the men were wrangling for the privilege of only touching it with their fingertips. For an hour and a half, that great mass of people slowly moved along the winding road up the steep incline of Mount Carmel. Once they reached the Shrine of the Bab, the coffin was placed on a table, and nine speeches were given by people of the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faiths. 
John Bosch concludes, It was a perfect day, one of the most beautiful one could imagine. As I turned and looked back now and then, many were the thoughts that came to me as I watched all those people wending their way up the mountain. Behind were the blue Mediterranean and the Bay of Haifa, and nine miles away was the old city of Akka, and in the far distance, the Lebanon mountains. Never can I forget that scene. Joanna Hauf used these words to describe how Abdul Baha was regarded by the people of Haifa. To the government and nobility, Abdul Baha was Sir Abbas Effendi. To the poor, their benefactor. To the inhabitants of Haifa, their counselor. To others, their greatest philosopher, scholar, and sage. Joanna Hauf concluded her reflections with these words, useless my life would appear to me if the power of the experience does not give me strength to really remold my life and to lead it to a high purpose. Indeed, the experience of being in Haifa a century ago at the passing of Abdul Baha at his funeral and at the public reading of his will and testament inspired these believers to a life of service to the cause. Joanna Hauf was uh, given, was spent the remainder of her life dedicated to the service of the cause. And the wife of Abdul Baha said to Joanna Hauf that her presence on the night of the passing of Abdul Baha was on behalf of the German people. Indeed, Abdul Baha loved the Baha'is of Stuttgart, Germany. And it was to this community to which Abdul Baha's last tablet was sent. John and Louise Bosch started the Geyserville Baha'i School, which attracted hundreds of participants every summer to build capacity to teach the cause to others. Grace and Florian Krug made significant contributions to the work, teaching work in a small village in northern Italy called Madonna di Campiglio. And Curtis Kelsey, beloved to so many of us here in America, one might say that when Curtis Kelsey had this passport photo taken in early September 1921, it marked the beginning of the great services he would render the cause over the course of his life. He was just 27 years old when he installed the electricity in the shrines of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. And when the lights were turned on for the first time, it was for many in Haifa, the first time that they had seen lights in the darkness. What a unique service indeed. The story of Curtis Kelsey is beautifully written about in this book by Nat Redstein, the husband of Curtis Kelsey's daughter, Carol Kelsey Redstein. Not only did Curtis Kelsey install the lighting for the holy shrines, but he returned to Haifa in 1956 when the Guardian called upon him to install irrigation lines for the future gardens that would carpet the surroundings of the Holy Shrine of the Bab. And in addition to installing electricity to the Shrine of Baha'u'llah, Curtis Kelsey installed the water lines that would irrigate the majestic gardens that surround the Holy Shrine of Baha'u'llah. The epilogue to this story brings us to those who remained in the house of Abdul Baha after his passing. We learn of the daughter of Baha'u'llah, the greatest holy leaf, and her exalted rank and extraordinary station in religious history, and of Munire Khanum, the wife of Abdul Baha, and the very personal expression of her grief upon the passing of her beloved. We know that the public reading of the will and testament of Abdul Baha was read in the entry hall to the house of Abdul Baha. I might add that the first election of the Universal House of Justice also took place in the same room where the will and testament of Abdul Baha was read, where those present learned that Abdu'l-Baha 
had appointed his grandson, Shoghi Effendi, as the guardian of the cause of Baha'u'llah. Shoghi Effendi's ministry lasted from the time of his appointment at the age of 24 until his passing in 1957 at the age of 60, and upon whose shoulders would fall the great work of the cause, which was primarily to carry out the provisions of Abdu'l-Baha's will and testament, to build up the divinely ordained administrative order of the cause, and to guide the expansion of the Baha'i community to all parts of the globe. The will and testament of Abdu'l-Baha also provided for the election of the Universal House of Justice, the supreme governing body of the Baha'is of the world with its seat on the slopes of Mount Carmel. For the past 25 years, the Universal House of Justice has guided communities across the globe in a worldwide effort, effort to advance the spiritual development of the individual and society through devotional gatherings which foster the spiritual unity of a neighborhood, village, or town, such as this one in Morang Sansari, Nepal, or this one in Puerto Tejada, Colombia. In addition to devotional gatherings, Baha'is and their neighbors come together for study circles for the purpose of developing in its participants the spiritual capacity for voluntary service in community development, such as this study circle in Dydenau, Myanmar, and this one in Toronto, Canada. Also, the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program gives young people between the ages of 12 and 15 the spiritual foundation to help them navigate through this critical stage in their development. These junior youth are studying together in Sinazesi, Zambia, and these junior youth are learning together in Tarabuco, Bolivia. Baha'is and their neighbors also participate in forming children's classes centered on the spiritual education of all the children in the neighborhood, village, or town. This children's class meets in South Tarawa, Kiribati, and this class meets in Nedrini, Panama, and this class meets in my living room. I was going to say my neighborhood, but I might as well say they also meet in my, in my living room. <laughs> Abdu'l-Baha's life of service to the cause of Baha'u'llah is indeed an inspiration to us all. The opportunity to help build spiritual capacities in our local community is a path of service open to everyone and can be thought of as a direct response to the inspiration of the life of Abdu'l-Baha. Baha'u'llah writes, O son of spirit, noble have I created thee. Rise then unto that for which thou wast created. I wanted to conclude with a reminder that part two of this webinar course is going to be on Sunday, January 9th, 2022, and the subject will be the centenary of the public reading of the will and testament of Abdu'l-Baha. The will was read privately to mem senior members of the family of Abdu'l-Baha on January 3rd, and then later there was a public reading, and we'll discuss that next webinar. The will and testament of Abdu'l-Baha is a document so potent that in a letter uh, written by on behalf of Shoghi Effendi, um, it says that it needs a century of actual working before the treasures of wisdom hidden in it can be revealed. And so those of you who are planning to attend the webinar on January 9th, um, maybe we can be thinking about what has this century of actual working of the will and testament of Abdu'l-Baha uh, done to reveal these treasures of wisdom hidden in it? And what are those treasures of wisdom? I'll certainly try to make that the focal point. So grab your copy of the will and testament of Abdu'l-Baha or get it online and um, go through it again or for the first time if you haven't already. 
Finally, this presentation was created entirely by me, and so any errors in it are entirely my own. The archival photos are the copyright of the United States Baha'i Archives, that wonderful treasure trove of gems open to all of us to, to go and search through. Some photos are, are from these websites and may be subject to copyright. Uh, MediaBahai.org, 239 days.com. My goodness, what a tremendous website if you haven't visited it already. And then Luminous Spot, um, he takes wonderful photographs and he does not require copyright. He um, makes them freely available. And the cover to When the Moon Set Over Haifa was actually taken uh, from a photo uh, from luminousspot.com. And then finally, the photograph of the room of Abdul Baha was taken by Denny Allen and used in this presentation for the Wilmette Institute by permission of the Universal House of Justice because um, photographs of inside of the holy places are not to be used without permission. And so it's nice to know that we've been given special permission to use this uh, photograph in this webinar and for this webinar to be posted online for the friends to see. And so that is the end of my presentation and I'll unmute my video and come back in person to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Angie, this it was absolutely incredible. You uh, spent so much time. Here's my. Here's what I was reading from. Just yeah, I didn't yeah, do that by spent, memory. I was reading. Spent so much time <laughs> to get this really prepared artistically, um, which is um, not just from a historically remarkable point of view, but from an artistically remarkable point of view. And we're very grateful that you put so much time and effort into this as a service to the friends, uh, and the of course the. Funeral of Abu Baha is a really amazing event and a, an event we, you know, really need to learn so much more about. Uh, and as as Taliba says, you are you are a great storyteller. Uh, oh, so Taliba uh, son. Um, hello. Yeah. <laughs> she knows. She knows what I'm what what is in my heart. Um, it is, it, I, this meeting has just been made whole knowing that Taliba is, is right here. Yeah, she says she's crying. No. She says, I love you. I um, love you, Taliba. Um, we have a few questions and answers coming up and people occasionally raise their hands, but I should point out to people that we don't normally share uh, people's cameras and uh, microphones in our webinar. And it's very complicated because we have a long list of people. We would have to go down and find the person. So. Please don't raise your hand. The best thing to do is to use either the chat feature or the Q&A feature. I have both of them open right now. And we can um, pick up your, your questions quite easily that way. Um, so that would be what we suggest. And uh, I'm wondering, how long after the funeral were these believers present? Do you know? Oh, answer? yes. Um, most of them stayed through February. Um, the Boches, in fact, were invited personally by Bahia Khanum to stay and mourn with the family. Um, and uh, when we get to the second part of this webinar, it will include um, some of the things that happened uh, afterward, uh, which, in, it, which I'll just give you a teeny little preview and say that Shoghi Effendi handed a portion of the will and testament to John and Louise Bosch and oh. asked them to deliver it to the convention in America. And oh. it's, um, it's, so I will, I will share that. John Bosch wrote so many wonderful notes, thank goodness. Um, so we have all this from his own hand that he wrote down all of these accounts of what happened. How far does your book go uh, into the future through February or does it go beyond that? Um, Obviously you follow yeah, the people in their right. later lives to some extent. Yeah. So what, um, what this, so there are four, there's an introduction and an epilogue, and then there are these four chapters in the body of the book. And it, it takes you through the lives of each of these people. So one chapter is John and Louise Bosch, how they came to the faith, 
what brought them to the Holy Land at that time and what did they do after? And then it all that is from their perspective. Then it kind of starts over again. And now we start with Joanna Hauff. Who was she? How what was her path to the cause? How did she end up in Haifa? What did she do while she was there? And what were her perspectives of what was going on? So you get these different lenses. And then we start over and go to Grace mm-hmm. and Florian Krug and we get their perspective. So it, it, the whole idea was to, to take these different points of view. And certainly we know that, of course, there were many other believers present, but um, uh, we, the only Western believers, in other words, the only ones taking notes in English where people like me can take those notes and write them in a book. But um, certainly someone could take the the diary papers of other believers who are writing in another language and tell it from their perspective. Yeah, I had never heard of John Huff, Huff before. And so I'm very oh. very happy to learn about her i kept counting six and i could count five and who was the sixth one so yes that's a well, very interesting addition yes and you know in um i've mentioned this before at the time that i wrote the john bosch book which has a chapter on the passing of abdul baha i was relying on hassan balyuzi who said that there were seven western believers uh yeah. and uh, ethel rosenberg but she yeah, and then later. later we learned that she did not arrive until afterward but um so i was relying on you know i didn't even you know uh suspect that hassan how paul Yuzi would have it wrong but our information grows as time right. goes on right and we're just working with the best information we have at the time but now right. we he, know he knew she was there pretty quickly there but not how when she arrived i right. believe in the ethel rosenberg book it says that she was on the train on her way north oh, from Egypt yeah. and she heard, heard or read it in the newspaper that Abu Bahad passed. So yeah. it was a tragedy. She she was on her way. Yeah. Yes. But many of her letters home are written in such a way it makes it sound like she was there. So it's a little, it, anyway, the, um, but we have it straight now. And um, there we know that the, these were the six who were there. There were others there in the, the few days prior, yeah. but they had gone to Egypt or went traveling or, you know, left Haifa and were not there that night. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Several people have said thank you very much, Rana Schechter, Angie. Wonderful presentation you have brought to life the days before Abu Bahá's ascension today, as well as in your extremely well-written book. Love to you, my friend. Keep researching and writing, and that's certainly uh, a sentiment that I share as well. Keep researching and writing, definitely. Oh, um, thank, thank you, Rana. That's and, Fred Schechter's daughter-in-law. Yep. Fred Schechter was such an inspiration to all of us to tell these stories. Yep. He was, he was an amazing man. Yeah. And Diane uh, Bayless, fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Jonathan Gamble wants to know about how you became a Baha'i and and your (laughs) embrace of the faith. Perhaps you could say a few things about that. Yeah, I can say uh, briefly is um, uh, it, it kind of happened two paths. So um, my dad was very close friends with, Uh, Lloyd Haynes, many of you may remember him as the African-American actor who was the teacher on the TV show called Room 222. And he and my dad were very close friends. Lloyd handed my dad a copy of God Passes By. (laughs) I mean, in other words, that's a pretty heavy book. It's a 100-year history of the uh, first 100 years history of the faith. And he handed it to my dad and said, here, read this and tell me what you think. (laughs) <laughs> so my dad read it and of course then um Lloyd really um shepherded my parents and um took them to firesides and uh, really kept put, kept them under his wing until we became Baha'is and then uh we became Baha'is and, and my dad my mom and dad wanted to go pioneering and we we didn't have a lot of money at the time and so Lloyd uh, deputized us to go pioneering oh. and paid for us to go to um, Argentina. And then while we were in Argentina, um, my great grandmother, uh, my great great grandmother's Bible had been unearthed by my grandmother. And in it, she found pictures of Abdul Baha 
in the Bible. And um, then we learned later that she had met Abdul Baha when he came to America. And, and that, so that, so our path to the faith, you know, kind of happened in two ways where Lloyd was that vehicle to remind us what we really are. And really, I think that's what a Baha'i teacher does is reminds us where, where our path came from and puts us on that path. And so, and then Lloyd, of course, um, his, he's a Baha'i because his father was working in a factory in Indiana and Louis Gregory South gathered where I live, <laughs> gathered all of the, uh, yes. all the workers in that factory and delivered the message to them. And Lloyd Haynes, father was one of the persons who, to whom, uh, Louis Gregory delivered that message. So my dad always said that, you know, we have a picture of Louis Gregory and he says, well, that's your spiritual grandfather. <laughs> so. And, and Lloyd Haynes's sister, an elderly sister, is in a nursing home here in town, in fact. And um, I, I went over to her house for a few home visits back 10 years back, and she was still living in the funeral home that I think maybe it was her uncle owned, because they uh-huh. were, it was a, two funeral oh, homes wow. across the street that Haynes Brothers mm-hmm. owned huh. in the African-American side of town. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, yeah, wonderful. With, with, with Don Streets, his father, uh-huh. who was one of the first African-American dentists, and mm-hmm. Dr. Love, who was one of the other first mm-hmm. African-American dentists here in town. The mm-hmm. three of those three families were the mm-hmm. first African-American families, I, as far as I know, here in mm-hmm. South Bend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Lloyd goes to California and teaches your father. It's a fascinating, <laughs> yeah. fascinating story. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, I mean, I, and, and if you really think about, you know, I mean, you know, I have seven brothers and sisters. I mean, I had a gigantic family. Um, and um, Lloyd passed away in 1996, I think it was. And, but, um, you know, I, our, I mean, the, the result of that one effort of handing God passes by to my dad yeah. <laughs> um, saved all of us. Uh, uh, and put us on this path. It's just, we're so grateful, you know, to that. You know, and we all can think about that person who taught us and how grateful we are. And then the debt that we owe di- to return that and, and mm-hmm. you know, carry that on. <laughs> Fascinating. I'm looking to see what other questions we have. Lots and lots of people thanking you so much for your presentation. It really was a marvelous, marvelous presentation. Uh, so next time you'll talk about the reading of the will and testament. And as yeah. I understand it, the Guardian already knew, Shogi Fendi had, had knew bef- before January 3rd, the, the contents. Mm-hmm. So um, yes. he already had, had had that shock delivered to him. Yes. And yeah. then it was read on January 3rd to senior members of his family and, and Shogi Fendi absented himself. Uh, and then on January 7th, it was read, although I think the commemoration this year is actually because of the calendar. I can't quite explain that. I, I understand it, but I can't explain it. The, the calendar reason, but the, the centenary will actually be on the 6th. But the, the reading of the, the public reading of the will was on January 7th. Mm-hmm. And, and how wonderful is it that in that will and testament, Abdul Baha outlines the provisions for electing the Universal House of Justice, yes. and then the House of Justice is elected in that same room mm-hmm. where the will and testament was read. Yep. I just think that's just—it's just so perfect yeah. and and wonderful. Yeah. I I don't yeah. I can't see all the participants, but I believe Sheila Walcott Banani might be on this call, and it is always such an honor to to think of really the the family of those first house members who made this tremendous sacrifice to serve the cause in this new institution Mm -hmm. and um the and really the the a gratitude goes to the members of the family of that individual um who uh, uh, this uh, it's it it renders me speechless really this, this feeling of gratitude that i have and um, also to think about, if I can just speak about Sheila Banani for a minute here, is that her, her uh, inspiration, you know, what, I like to think about time and she, her life 
of service to the cause is a is a physical real time example of yeah. almost of the period of time we're talking about yeah. and it just puts it in real time it's in the w- same way of thinking like think about time this way for any of us present at this meeting tonight today if we were at the um world congress in 1992 mm-hmm. okay so if you were there you put yourself back at the world congress in 1992 so the 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 we were commemorating the passing of out of Baha'u'llah, the hundred that you know 1892 to 1992. So in 19 in, in 1892, Abdul Baha assumes his ministry as the center of the covenant, and that lasts until 1921. Okay, so I was at the World Congress in 1992. Mm-hmm. And now it's 19 and now it's 2021. I have just lived through the period of time that is the ministry of Abdul Baha. Yes. That is not very much time. Yeah. yeah. When and now you put inside that timeline all of the things that Abdul Baha accomplished. Yeah. It is it's really it's, r- remarkable. It's just what it's good to put things in terms of time that way for us so that we yeah. put it in real time yeah i was born in 1953 so you go back to 1853 and yeah. i've essentially lived the length of baha'u'llah's public ministry and abel baha's i love ministry. it and it's really quite uh, i i love it it's startling it's oh startling yeah that i that's been, yeah 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 so we you and robert you and i were talking about the nine-year plan we can now yeah think about in nine years from now and plan everything even our 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 finances plan our finances around yes. uh, being able to serve the faith and this cause and advance its goals over the next nine years yes and what 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 an amazing nine years that will be and uh we'll be witnessing the the nine years that are the centenary of the first nine years of the the uh, formative age as well and the, mm. the first nine years of the guardianship uh, there you go i love it per- oh perfect yep. i love it yep. yeah it's quite amazing mm-hmm. it is quite amazing well i i don't see any other questions so well, someone just made the point or i was tell a taliban just made the point that of course the meeting of the counselors and the auxiliary board members in haifa has been uh, called off because of right. the pandemic unfortunately mm-hmm. and uh so that I suppose they'll have to come up with an alternative system using Zoom or something to accomplish the goals that they had set for that particular really historic meeting that will uh, unveil the goals of the nine-year plan and uh, bring about the consultation that will uh, inspire the participants to go back to their home countries Mm -hmm. and bring those goals to their countries. Right. Yeah, and so maybe next time when we come together for the next webinar, we really can have rather than questions and answers, maybe people making uh, contributions about what they think those hidden mysteries are that are now revealed yeah. after a century of, of yeah. this will and testament working. And what what is it that that we is so cl- much more clear to us? Um, now that it's been working for 100 years. Yeah, I, the first thing I thought of was the hints that the guardianship won't go on forever. Various provisions in the will, which increasingly people are pointing out and saying mm-hmm. those provisions make sense mm-hmm. because the guardianship ended with the passing of Shoghi Effendi in, in mm-hmm. 1957. So there are indeed many of these these little um, sort of treasures in there that mm-hmm. that make sense Mm-hmm. as a result of the passage of time mm-hmm. yeah well right. thank you very much yeah. for this very very moving and, and inspiring presentation we're very grateful yeah you're it. welcome i uh, want to thank our audience today for their questions and answers and their comments and i want to wish everyone the best and we look forward to seeing you again 